Hello, everyone. My name is T.A. Duan with EW Klein, and I'm here with Anthony Bucci. Hey, everyone. Anthony Bucci with EW Klein. Um, so today, we're going to talk about uh, liquorine vacuum pump and its use with VFD. Um, we talked about uh, maybe next time we should have a cool intro music of vacuum cleaner <laughs> running the back. <laughs> and a nice drum roll, something to lead into it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, have a slogan or something. What was your slogan that you saw? <laughs> we suck, so you don't have to. The vacuum guys. Yeah. Oh, that would go real far. <laughs> it could go a lot of different Mom, ways. You're so proud of me. <laughs> okay. So, um, I mean, Anthony, you and I are pretty familiar with a liquid vacuum pump, how it operates. But yes, we get a refresher course on, you know, so everyone else is on the same page. So we're, you know, on the same page. So a liquid vacuum pump. Uh, this is a cross section of it. I always tell everyone that I show this to, I wish this, and it's technically animation, but I wish animation would start before the rotation of the rotor happens. Um, because a liquid vacuum pump, you have housing, circular housing, then you have a rotor assembly that's off center from the center of the housing. So, and this blue ring around here is actually the liquid ring. Most, most applications would just be water. Uh, I wish the animation would start where it's actually, you know, not turning and the water just be half filled with the pump. Yeah, but this so is we're, kind of seeing, a, we're seeing the rotor in action. The liquid ring is already formed. We've got the buckets there, but you'd like it to start where the water is in the middle showing it at a dead standstill. Yeah, because when I start, you know, first using this animation to explain to myself, and I had a actually had a the dumb aha moment of like, oh yeah, this blue ring is actually a liquor ring. Yeah, I did the <laughs> same thing. <laughs> it's like, otherwise, it's like oh, just spinning. Great. Yeah. What? Um, but uh, so, anyways, yeah, you're right. So this is already in rotation, uh, and we call the space between these two blades uh, a bucket, right? So. Mm -hmm. At the bottom of the rotation, the bucket's filled with water, and as it rotates up, it goes this way, as it throws up, um, the water gets thrown away from the center of the rotation. So that's what, that separation is what creates the vacuum. So, you know that. so this is the inlet, so as it separates and creates the vacuum, gas gets pulling from the inlet and gets into um, the space that's now opened up. Um, and and then uh, come from this side, as it's kind of comes to the bottom of the rotation again, the gas gets squeezed out and compressed out uh, by the bucket and the water, and that's discharged out. So what discharge is, like, it's a mix of gas and water, real quickly. But have you seen this? Um, you went up to Bentleyville in uh, Pennsylvania, up to Nash, right? Have you been there? I have not been up to Bentleyville, no. Okay. So up there, um, they actually had this little um, demo pump. So Neat. That was kind of cool. Yeah, so it's yeah, like all. Plexiglass. Yeah, so it's all clear, um, see-through pump. So you have in the housing and the rotors is off center, hmm. and uh, like I said, you know, this is kind of start filling up with water. It's not running yet, and when they turn it on, this is low RPM. They have a on a VFD actually, so they're turning okay. like a potentiometer dial to increase the speed. So this is kind of low RPM. You can tell like it's kind of bubbly. Yeah. Water in there turbulent at low RPM because it's just literally trying to stir in water but it's not in a very it's like you can't it's not stirring fa water fast enough. I'm moving fast, yeah. Yeah. Create the the little ring. So as it gets faster um on the RPM it actually creates the liquid ring. If you can see and this is yeah. the inner side of the ring so neat. Yeah. So this is all water here. It's clear water of course, you know it's hard to tell. I wish they would dye the water like a different color so you can actually see oh, it clearly. That'd be smart. That's something yeah. we could do. Yeah, true. <laughs> so that's essentially what the inside of the liquid ring looks like. So, you know, it's not exactly this smooth, nice ring in that will, what the animation shows. Yeah. Um, so next one, that was the liquid ring vacuum pump. And, you know, talking about liquid ring vacuum pump and the VFD, so the next one is VFD. Um, to talk about VFD, the variable frequency drive or frequency inverter, or um, I think those are the two most common names used. Uh, we talk about this. Uh, so, AC power, DC power. AC power is this attenuating sine wave of power. Okay. Uh, so, and DC power is a constant steady, whatever voltage it is. Um, and, you know, we all know, hopefully, most of us will know the difference between these two. and 
um, most power transmissions across long distance is used uh, AC power. And DC power is a lot of time in industrial applications, more for like control, like 24 volt control voltage. Okay. Um, so, like I said, in transmission, um, you know, you're taking power from power plants or so <clears throat> generation sites and you put it into these industrial motors. So, AC power from transmission line, and a lot of these motors with our AC motors. So, you know, if the AC power comes in is, I say, 60 hertz, mm -hmm. you know, the, the frequency of it is 60 hertz, depending on it's 60 times a second, um, then 60 hertz. So, if it's 60 hertz coming in, then the motor will get 60 hertz as well. So, the motor, AC motor, run at that speed. So, if it's a design, the motor is designed to run, say, you know, 1080 RPM at 60 hertz, you pipe, you, you, you connect it with the power grid of 60 mm -hmm. hertz coming in, it's going to turn at, you know, 1080 RPM because it's getting okay. 60 hertz power. But if you put in a VFD, you know, you put in AC power into the VFD, and what the VFD does is essentially uh, creates DC power. Um, you see, DC is a flat line, so it creates DC power, but it creates it at different steps. So it's kind of simulating an AC voltage by turning AC into DC. And then so you can, they have, now you have the flexibility to simulate it to 60 hertz, to 40 hertz, to 45 hertz, to 50 hertz. It can even change the voltage, you know, so from 460 volts, it can change to 30 volts. Mm, so that's kind of okay. what a VFD does. It essentially takes AC power and turn it into DC, but you know, create it in a form that simulates AC power that and feeds it into the motor. So the motor won't see any difference. This thing is still AC power. Interesting. Okay. So essentially, the VFD allows us to take the AC power that's coming in from the power lines, change it into a DC current, but also kind of replicate the AC pattern so that you can power your equipment in your plant uh, at, I guess, whatever hertz that the motor likes or, or, or whatever you want, really. Or whatever yeah. you want, okay. So um, I've seen some of the VFD use in the, with liquid vacuum pump, as these natural vacuum pumps, um, in the sense of like change, literally changing the RPM of the, the pump operation, depending on the uh, capacity the operation needs. So, you know, this is a typical pump curve, the like XL250 uh, Nash pump. So if uh, we, you know, plug a VFD to it and turn the motor, turn the pump at, you know, 1080 RPM. And if the operation is running at like 20 inches mercury gauge, then, you know, the curve will tell us it's going to run, you know, get a capacity of about 1300 ACFM. Uh, so, you know, if you turn, if you either use a dial or change the setting on the VFD to say drop the RPM to, 750 RPM <clears throat> for the same operation at 20 inches mercury gauge. Now you're just pulling a 900 ACFM. Um, so th there's advantage to that where, um, you know, for an operation that has different capacity needs throughout mm -hmm. different products or processes, um, you can probably save some, you know, some energy cost consumption because now slower RPM have less horsepower consumption. So it's gotcha. That. But there's a there's a there's a, a limitation to all this. Like, remember earlier we saw you know at the little demo pump was going to, as it's starting up, mm -hmm. uh, it's low RPMs, really turbulent in there. It's the same thing here too. If the pump doesn't spin fast enough, you know these pump curves only go down to 600 RPMs. So if anything below that on the on the pump speed, it's likely that um, the pump is not spinning fast enough to create that stable liquid rein to actually pull any vacuum. Yeah. So. But I tell you what, there's another kind of a um, seen this application being done a few places, um, and I was kind of cautioned against doing it because it's not very reliable. Mm -hmm. This this idea using a PID loop. So um, you know, this is a, a typical setup that you will see from you know the Nash you know, vacuum pump setup. You mm -hmm. have a inlet separator process there it goes in here, and then you know, separates the liquid that's going to evacuate the liquid from the little pump, pump on the bottom, mm -hmm. and the gas goes through into the, the pump, and the liquid rim pump. And that works pretty well for the most part. Um, I've seen some processes, and I've, I've been trying to replicate this on a couple other applications, is they'll put a, um, a little vacuum transducer on the um, inlet separator. 
measure the vacuum depth, right? Mm -hmm. And then they'll use a VFD to control the RPM of the pump. And they'll tie these two together through a PID control. Um, and PID control stands for, um, the P is for proportional, I is for integral, and D is for derivative. So it's an algorithm. Wow. Yeah, it's not to be confused with, with P and ID, which is like uh, between piping and instrumentation diagram, or okay. yeah, process or instrument that patient diagram. Um, so it's a an algorithm that it takes in, essentially takes in the information from the transducer and it adjusts the RPM on the pump to meet the a set point that you want to put on here. And, and there are a lot of you know processes in the manufacturing that use it to kind of do self uh, self you know clo call it closed loop control. So you know it's okay. pretty useful. Um, algorithm control mechanism, but and I'll tell why in this it with the liquid ring pump it doesn't work very well. Mm. So the way you know, I, I honestly like learning about PID loop I, in my previous job because I was a controls guy background. Um, so I had to do a quite a few PID tuning. So it, learning what they all mean and how to tune it, it's more of an art than science sometimes. Okay. So but imagine you know you're rowing a boat and uh, you're rowing towards shore. This is kind of far away from the shore, but just imagine you're rowing the boat to the shore, getting close to the shore. The distance to the shore is P, and you can understand that as P, okay. uh, proportional. And as you get closer to the shore, you know, you have velocity, but you want to slow down a little bit. So, you know, as you're pedaling backwards and slow down your approach, that's I. Okay. And once you get to shore, you know, as soon as you get to shore, you, you, you know, once you hit the shore, your boat wants to bounce back a little bit. And you're, you know, you kind of reverse the direction of the oar, trying to push yourself back into the shore so you don't depart from the shore too fast. And that last the action is D. Okay. It's and like sliding like, into a base for baseball, or I imagine a skydiver when they land and they've got to like time their, their landing with the run. Yeah. Does that play into that at all? It seems like it'd be. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. And, and we do it like, as humans, we can do it so fast, right? Because like it's. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to keep yourself balanced. We're thinking about how to, I don't know, just kind of predict and how much we need to slow down or speed up to over, overtake someone or something like that. Sure, right? yeah, driving. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's that we're, humans are kind of, you know, it's intuitive in our minds. So the, it's kind of machines trying to do that, um, you know, wow. in the PID loop, it's, it's own algorithm trying to, to shoot into the set point. So this, okay. these three kind of graph kind of shows that too. So you have a set point. Um, for whatever you know, data is. For example, um, for the tunnel, since we're talking about vacuum pumps, so the set point say is 25 inches of mercury. Okay. Um, and the input becomes the motor. If you if you tie the VFD to a uh, motor, and then mm -hmm. input becomes motor RPM. So what it will do is, if you set for 25 inches of mercury, it's going to try to speed up the motor, and if you don't if you don't tune the PID values correctly, you can just overshoot that. You know, you run too fast or have too much of, um, of vacuum depth. And then you're trying to slow down the pump, and then you slow down too much. Now you, you go below the set point. Then you'll speed back up again, up and down, up and up, up and down. So it's called oscillation. That's how you make spaghetti. That's how you make spaghetti. And really unstable vacuum process. And then there's the challenge of undershoot where you're just not getting up to the set point fast enough. Okay. So it's it's tough to tune a PID loop on the um, on the liquid in vacuum pump. And I've I've tried it down it a couple of times. Um it takes a little while to get there. Um but the challenge is becomes like it just as the vacuum set point changes, it mm -hmm. becomes very difficult for it to go to an ideal just jump right to it. It'll oscillate and overshoot. It's cost okay. <clears throat> There is another way, instead of using motor RPM to adjust the vacuum, um, uh, you use a controlled lead valve, the vacuum lead valve, essentially. Because you know, even, even in Nash vacuum pump setup, if somebody wants to control the vacuum depth, we tell them that you know, use a vacuum relief valve to minimize how, you know, to limit how deep the vacuum will go. Because yeah. you create it early, you push back down on the curve, on the vacuum curve. Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of setup, it's kind of elaborate setup, um, it, but it, it does use another, you know, kind of PID control loop. But now it's just the PID control. It doesn't control the motor RPM, but it controls how much 
the vacuum will leave opens and closed, how much area lets into the system. So okay. that way you maintain the uh, vacuum depth that way. Just for my, my exposure, it, it kind of makes sense that it might be easier to control it with the relief valve than it would be to control the actual motor to, to bleed off more air than it would be to, to uh, increase or decrease your motor RPM. Yeah, because when you, when you start messing with the motor RPM, you start just changing, jumping around on, on pump curves. <laughs> yeah, <So thanks. laughs> you're kind of hopping around from different Yeah, curves. thanks again, Anthony, for, uh, for entertaining me with this, and um, hope I... Uh, I hope our discussion was productive and learned something. Yeah, TA, thank you. Uh, great information. I learned a whole bunch and uh, look forward to the next one. Yeah, absolutely. So everyone have a good have a good rest of the week. Have a good one. All right, see you. All right, bye.